Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So today is a uh, case seminar. We have visitors from uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Uh, we have two speakers today, and these are the presentations based on TRB papers. Uh, our first presentation will come from Sina. Sina is a, is a master's candidate and, uh, uh, at Southern Illinois University. Works with Dr. Osuli. He also graduated from, from here uh, years ago. He's now a professor at the Southern Illinois University. And his topic is about the effects of sediments on bioswale and infiltration trench best management practices performance. And I will give him uh, 15 minutes for his presentation. I will have some questions after his presentation, and then we'll switch to Pradeep's presentation after, after we are done with the, with the QA. Let's just welcome Sina for his presentation. Thank you. Hi, Ash. Thank you very much. Thank you for introduction. Okay, I, I think I'm on. Okay. So, uh, so as uh, Dr. Sun said, my uh, presentation is about the uh, effect of sedimentation on biosol and infiltration trench BMP performances. And this uh, research has done by so many people, so I'm not going to get all the credits. However, I'm the one that presented it here, so. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Usuli from SIUE, a PhD candidate, Azadeh from SIUC, myself and Dr. Barlow from Ida Illinois Department of Transportation. The outline, well, is introduction, objectives, procedure, results, and conclusion of this research. The uh, well, the BMPs are mainly built and maintained to, for water treatment uh, in different projects. In this is a specific project, uh, we shed lights on the linear project when the BMP is used. And we weren't uh, discussed the part of the water treatment and water quality, but we put focus on the effect of sediments on the performance of the BMP. We, look at, we basically look at the BMP as a different angles that they're going to help us to uh, empty the runoff after the storm event from the highways and then how we can reduce the peak of runoff uh, during the storm event. So, and how the sedimentation, which is a good representative of the aging, can affect the performance of the BMPs. So, in a simple word, we have new BMP versus aged BMPs. The difference would be the sedimentation on top of it. During the rainfall and the new BMPs, you're going to see a lot of infiltration and you're going to have some runoff, of course, but and the HBMP, we know that the infiltration is going to be less because of the sedimentation, and runoff would be more. But how much more? So that would be the objective of this research. So we're going to quantify that, that how much runoff going to in increase on different storm, uh, storm scenarios and the aging on the BMPs, and then we simulate it by the numerical modeling, and also we validate the numerical modeling, the result that we got from that by the field test that we ran. So basically calibrate a model to be used for different purposes. So this research consists of three parts. First was the field part that we designed. We focused on the infiltration trenches and the biosuels with new ones, two-year-old and 10-year-old, under different uh, storm, storm scenarios. Then we did the numerical modeling for the same test. We calibrate, we calibrate the models, the numerical model with the field test and then uh, we produce the, we basically we provide a model to be used for different scenarios in that range, rainfall-wise and the age-wise. Uh, the location of the field test was in the campus of Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, this point. I have a better photo of this. Well, you're going to see it with the better details, but it's what Google Map, the best image that you can see from the Google Map. The schematic layout of the whole project was kind of like this. We have the water tanks, water reservoir to collect, to basically store the uh, rainfall in them and then deliver them. We have the pipelines to the biosuels and the infiltration trench. Uh, the number one indicates the 10-year-old, the the, um, then the two-year-old and the brand new one. The same story for the infiltration trenches. The flow was controlled and monitored by the flowmeters that we have at the beginning of the pipelines of each section. And then, uh, in order to, uh, we had to, what we look for was the runoff. So we had 
through runoff collects your tanks here, the, the, the exceeded water on top of the biofuel was pumped out into the uh, runoff collector tanks, and then it measured, the volume was measured to know that how much runoff we got done for each test. A more detailed view of each test would be something like this, the valve is got open, the water enters in from the, the distributed on top of the BMPs or test cell by, uh, by the perforated pipes. We had an observation well, as you can see, an eight inches pi plastic pipes serves us as an observation well to monitor the water level inside of the each BMPs. And of course, each BMP was surrounded by the impermeable berm to do not have water interfere from the outside and no water from top of the BMP should go out and no water from outside should go in. And also we, can, we could control, we have a kind of like isolated atmosphere for the BMPs. The cross section so shows the same story. The only thing that on the infiltration trench, we didn't have anything but the gravels with the void ratio of 52%. But on the biosuel, it was a little bit more detailed because we have a filters after the three quarter of the depth of the each test cells. We have a filter and the growing medium. The growing medium PI was zero. The infiltration rate was 12 millimeter per minute. The natural soil was basically everywhere at the top and as a surroundings was this uh, sandy lean clay with the PI of almost 20% and infiltration rate was uh, five millimeter per minute. We use the same soil, the, the nature soil, native soil, for the sedimentation as well. We sieve it via sieve number eight, and we pour distributed evenly on top of the biosuels and infiltration trench as a sedimentation representer of the aging. The natural soil was sandy link clay. The PI was 20%. It was fairly homogeneous. We didn't see anything but the, the soil was surprisingly clean and homogeneous. The number eight, uh, with passing sieve number eight was sieved, used for sedimentation, and is Azadeh doing uh, the infiltration test with the inf uh, turf tech infiltrometer at the bottom of this uh, bottom of a test cell. Well, it, actually, this one is in a, each of the test cell. It was was just another uh, kind of basically trench that we dug somewhere else to just test the infiltration uh, rate of the natural soil adjacent to the test cells to know that how much would, would that be. Well, all the details that I told you in the cross section is again presented here with minor details that the infiltration rates Every, uh, everywhere we discuss is in a saturated condition, and the sediment for two-year-old uh, biosuel or infiltration trench we got uh, we got 9.1 millimeter per minute for the sedimentation. So I mean we put the turf tech infiltrometer on the top of the uh, two-year-old biosuel, and we get 9 uh, 9.01 millimeter per minute for that, and we got for 10-year-old we got almost six millimeter per minute infiltration trench at the top of the biosuels. So we set it up, the test cell. Next uh, step is the storm farm scenarios. Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, or IEPA, recommends the new development sites uh, should be designed for one, off, uh, one inch rainfall retained runoff. So we get that, we consulted the IDF curve, and based on those, we got for the 10 year, two year, and nine months return uh, storm, uh, we got how much uh, rainfall we have, and we got the intensity, and we know how big was the watershed, the drainage area. So we calculating those, we calculate how much would be the volume of the total volume of the water that we need to introduce on the BMPs. And also we get the, with the intensity, also we got the time. So what we needed to introduce what we need to, as an input for our test, but the flow rates to be controlled, and also the time. So we needed those two. So with the IDF curve, with the return, uh, return uh, storm, storm return data, and everything else, IDF curve, we got these two numbers. And also with the 10 year data, we got it from the rain gauge in the Belleville. We, uh, we come up with high rainfall and medium rainfall 
which was the, these, these two had the 88 and 99.7 percentile of the rainfalls on that area. So we, we got to consider those two as a, have a broader range of rainfall scenarios for our tests. The area that we assumed and presented in our test was a 15.5 meter drainage area and uh, almost one meter, 0.9 meter uh, biosoil or infiltration trenches. And we just model it for 2.4 hour, uh, basically eight feet width of a linear project. So with this data, we, we introduced two possible scenarios. The possible one, four lane roadway with a shoulder and for the slope or a four lane roadway with this shoulder and the forest slope. So we kind of, there are other possible scenarios, but these are the input for the model. For the field test, we just used uh, the 15.5 meter drainage area. So we got the drainage area, we got the tests, uh, test cells and every detail that we needed. The next step would be, okay, how, how much, how are you gonna Calculated, what does it mean when you say 10 year old biosoil or two year old biosoil? You should have a good estimation of the erosion rate of the soil in that area. So we consulted USLE equation according to these parameters that we have here, which is A is the average annual soil loss, R is the rainfall runoff ero erosivity factor, K is the soil erosivity factor, and LS is the lens slow factor, C is the cover management factor, and P is the support management factor. Anyway, long story short, we come up with uh, 0.847 US ton per acre per year. So we have a drainage area, we have the, so we know how much, how much is the area. We know how much soil loss we're gonna have for that area, so and we know you know that we're gonna use it for two year or two year and ten year. So we got the area, we got the age, so we can calculate how much would be the total soil loss, how much would be the total rate of a sediment should be distributed on top of the test cells. So it, it is how, how we got the sediment. So our calculation done is the construction side, it's the construction part. First the land was even then uh, the scaffolding and putting the, uh, the pipes and the tanks and everything, we use the gravity to deliver the water from the tanks to the test cells. We made a space here for the observation wells because we buried them four inches deep into the ground. Distribution of the gravels and using the impermeable berms around it and then for the biosoil, we put growing medium and then level the surface, the pipings, and we had a full trench here because we, we were dealing with the, with the slope here. So it was, and it was in November and uh, October, so we expect a lot of rainfall. So in order to keep these uh, test cells safe, we build up a trench here to basically get, uh, do not let the water in and interfere with, with the whole system and the flow meter that we use. It's the final view of the, the field test, the test cells and the water tanks and everything. So this is the test, uh, all the test uh, matrix that we have to run. Since we were looking for the runoff, if the test produced no runoff, we didn't continue on that matter. For example, for the biosoil two-year-old, we go with the high, high rain event. We didn't get, uh, we saw that it didn't get up uh, that much of a runoff that we want, so we didn't continue in that case. Or on 10 year old biosoil, for example, we did 10 year return uh, storm period. We didn't that much runoff, so we didn't continue to the less intense basically test. For infiltration test, we didn't get runoff no, regardless of the uh, sedimentation on top of them. So we just went with the most intensive one and we didn't continue the test. So the blue ones are the one that we run actually. It's, a it's the first test that uh, on a biosoil that we run for a brand new one, it didn't produce any runoff, but we had a pump ready always all the time here. If the water accumulation on top of the DMPs exceeded than two inches, we start pumping them out. And it was a bottom suction pump so we could get exactly at the elevation that we needed 
to get the, uh, the water out. We put the sensor, Hobo sensor, down into the observation well, and also we did measure the water level into the, in the observation well manually. So we did have two, uh, two methods, and then we compared them together. And it was in a good correlation, so we, in these slides, I'm gonna just show you the result that we got from the sensor, not the manual reading. The water level observation, the water level in observation well for different tests in a 10 year old biosuel, the oldest biosuel that we have is presented here. These three are the, from the IDF curve, 10, two and nine months return events. And these two are from the uh, ten, 10 year uh, rainfall data. The accelerated slope in all of them is, can be re good representer of the DMT infiltration rate and the descending part shows that the uh, natural soil infiltration rate because it's gonna get peaked and then it slows, goes down into the soil. Soil is fairly saturated and uh, you're gonna see what would be the volume of the water just infiltrated into the ground. So it could be a good representer of that. And the peak time is the test time plus the time does it take to the, all the water accumulated on top reach to the bottom or at the water level into the uh, test cells. Same for the infiltration trenches, since we didn't get what these are the most intense rainfall, since we didn't get any runoff from each of them and the oldest bios, uh, for the old biosuels, we then continued for the medium and high rain events. So we summarized the test for the biosuels and this graph, the inflows and the runoff for each test. As, as you can see, for 10 year old, the te uh, for the 10, the, the oldest biosuels, the, the runoff is fairly less than the inflow because of the intensity of the test. As it goes by to the uh, less intense, basically a storm, you're gonna observe less based runoff. With, uh, and the uh, same story for the medium and high rain events. So we collected the runoff for each test. Now we need we needed one uh, one number basically to summarize the test. Efficiency in volume reduction. Inflow minus outflow divided by the inflow as a present as a percent. So for each test, this is the number that said how much it reduced. The bigger the number, for example, for this nine months, 100%, meaning that we didn't get any outflow here, or for this one, the 10-year-old 10, 10 biosuel and the 10-year storm return, for 10-year-old biosuel, 26, meaning that the outflow and inflow differences was only 26%. So it's gonna be another uh, representer of the how we can basically uh, present the data and uh, show the performance of the, each one of them. For the high rain events, we, we cannot basically discuss for the medium or high because the total volume of the storm was uh, more than the capacity of the trench that we had. Uh, the, our trench, our test cell capacity for 250 gallons, but these two medium and high rain events had uh, 1,000 gallons and almost 4,000 gallons of rainfall. So for these two, the, the mechanism of the runoff is a little bit different than the other, these three. So the field tests are done. We use PC Swim because of uh, the user friendliness and the good engine and integrated GI GIS and uh, the Grim app method is used for the numerical modeling. The inputs are presented here for the drainage area and, uh, and for the biosuel, the slopes, the weights, the manning numbers and everything. So we got the runoff from the model and now we're gonna compare them together. That and we for the for the test uh, for the field test and for the uh, for the model. As you can see, the differences in the less intense rainfalls is a lot, while in the most in, the more intense one is less. Well, the reason that the model idealized the situation, we had a r lot of uh, escape ways in the field uneven distribution of the sediments, the settlements of the gravels. We could, during the test, we could hear sometimes the, uh, the basically the gravels moves, so it's gonna bring us the uneven settlements or uh, some features. 
and the soil was a little bit clay. So it, when it you when you make it wet and you let it dry, it shrinks a little bit. So one word, we had a lot of cracks and had a lot of escape waste. So we expect that to the runoff in the field be less than the runoff in the model. Why why the the difference is a less than more intense rainfall because you introduce a lot of water in a very short amount of time. So it didn't get time, basically, water to escape. Before it going to use those escape paths, we pump it, we pumped it out. And in the, and in the uh, older biosoils, it didn't have, the problem was less because of uh, the more sediment we use, one compensates the uneven settlement and going to basically clog those water, path, uh, water escape ways. So here, in, uh, compare them with the percentages instead of the volumes, as you can see, almost all of them, the differences between the model and the field test is less than 10% in the majority of the cases. So we can safely say our model worked and it get validated. So aging reduced the performance of the biosoil by 45% and 10 to 30% in average in 10 year old and two year old bi uh, biosoils respectively in infiltration trench didn't, didn't change at all. So, however, in the infiltration trench, when you put sediment, when you distribute the sediment, it washed away by each rain and goes down. So, in infiltration trench, probably you don't see anything until it gets completely filled up. The volume, the total volume is going to reduce. However, in the biosoil, the, the total volume remains intact. In fact, nothing changed. But the infiltration, the infiltration rate is going to reduce. So, you're going to have less water can go in, but the space is always there. You have always, you have, for example, in these tests, 250 gallons. But in filtration trenches, the, the, the rate is almost the same, but the volume is reduced by time. So the simulation showed the general agreement. Yes, as you can see, in the majority of the cases, the discrepancy was less than 10%. So we can say that in this range, you can use uh, the model instead of the field test, wherever your uh, basically test is in this range that you tested. And in uh, younger biosoil and less intense rainfall, the model overestimate the runoff because of the idealization of that the model have over the field test because of those water passes, the water can escape and everything that I've mentioned. So thank you for your patience. And if uh, keep the questions at the end. Yeah, don't keep the waitress before you, you pick you the before you bring the food because I haven't answered any question. Why you? you, you <laughs> I got lost. Minutes. <laughs> okay, sure. So let's just switch sure. that. Yeah. Okay, should we turn this up. And mm -hmm. So wait for uh, for questions for Sina, okay? Until we finish. Oh. We're done with the second it's presentation. It got lengthy. <laughs> Southern Illinois University. Pradeep is also a master's uh, uh, candidate at the university working with Dr. Rasuli. This time the presentation is, is about something that you know a little bit better. So uh, this is a soft and unsoft performance of crushed gravel and limestone aggregates. Are you ready, Sina? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Pradeep? Yeah, good. Let's welcome uh, Pradeep. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about soaked and unsoaked performance of cross gravel and cross limestone. Uh, let me first go to the contributors for this research. Actually, I am the presenter, only the presenter of this uh, study. However, uh, Dr. Ras, Dr. Abdul Reza Asuli is the advisor for this research. And the main uh, researcher students in SIUE, he, he is uh, Goran Osmanyani. He, although he graduated and he is not in US, so uh, I am just presenting this presentation. So here, the, uh, let's go into the topic. Here, the soaked and unsoaked CBR, uh, unsoaked term represents the CBR 
test. Here is the brief outline of the study uh, introduction, background, experimental approach, results, and discussion. Uh, we have the prediction model for shock CVR, and uh, we have strength zone and conclusion. So in the pavement structures, we have four different layers, surface course, base course, sub-base course, and subgrade layer. Sometimes the sub-base layers is optional. So depending upon the requirement, we can omit the sub-base sub course. The main function of base and sub-base course is to transmit the wheel load from surface to the subgrade layer. So if the strength of base and sub-base layer is not good enough, then we can see the rotting uh, phenomena. For the design of pavement structure, we have two different guidelines, ASPRO guidelines and MEPDC guidelines. And under those guidelines, we have two different approaches for designing. One is strength-based approach, and another one is stiffness-based approach. In strength-based approach, it focuses for the maximum load that can be carried by the aggregate before the failure. But in stiffness-based method, we consider this method when we need the deformation uh, behavior of the material under cyclic loading. So in a study conducted by Dr. Tutumler in 2013, uh, which was included in NCHRP 445, out of 46 states, 48 percentage of those states, they used to prefer, uh, they prefer to use correlation between CVR and index properties. 22 percentage of the states, they use resilient modulus tests, and remaining 30 percentage of the states, they use the different methods for uh, the designing of the payment. Since 48 percentage of states, they still use the CVR test, so we, in the lab, uh, the CVR test was performed. And many states still prefer unsoaked CVR over soaked CVR, because soaked CVR is very time consuming. We have to soak it for up to four days. So our, our the objective of this uh, of the study is to identify the quality control guide for index properties for the soaked and unsoaked CVR. The, the second objective is to develop a method to estimate soaked CVR based on unsoaked CVR. So let's go to the background. So the strength of aggregates are affected by gradation, types of aggregates, texture, and plasticity index, and also the duration of soaking. Under the gradation, we have the skip grading, fines content, and maximum particle size. So here, the skip grading or dust ratio is the, uh, is the, the ratio of particles passing number 200 sieve to number 40 sieve. The fines content is the amount of particles passing number 200 sieve. And the different states have different um, criteria to use the maximum limits of those, these properties for fines content, for dust ratio, for plasticity index, for liquid limit. They have different standards. They have different requirements. So most of the states, they use 12 to 15 percent of fines content. But states like Colorado and even ASTO standards, they, they use up to 20 percent of fines content. But the state like Washington, they have only 10 percent of fines content uh, limit. If we see for the dust ratio, many of the states, they don't have any requirements for dust ratio. But some of the states, those who have, they have, uh, uh, they have the criteria up to 0 0.66. For plasticity index and, uh, and liquid limit, they come, they come together. So ma many of the states, they prefer to use the uh, plasticity index less, less than 6 percentage. For liquid limit, they, uh, they, they use less than 25 percentage. But the states like North Carolina, you can see here North Carolina, uh, they had a liquid limit up to 30 percent also. So based on those different requirements, the, the different states, based on uh, how they use, we come up with the test matrix 
within uh, trying to be within that limit. So we have the plasticity index of 5% and 9%, fines content of 5% and 12%, dust ratio of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 1. Here the dust ratio 1 is out of the um, requirement of the um, requirement of many states, but we try to see here the effect of skip grading on the strength of aggregates. And we have the gradation of CA6, which is the Illinois uh, DOT classification, and material type of cross gravel and cross limestone. Uh, also, uh, here we have the naming for different samples. We have A, B, C for uh, the for the PI of 5% and DEF for PI of 9%. On the, in the same way, we have the number follow, following the letter A. The number, those number represents the fines content. So for example, if we say A5 is for plasticity of 5% and fines content of 5% and dust ratio of 0.4. CA6 gradation is commonly used gradation in the state of Illinois. It, uh, it has the maximum particle size of one inch. And if we compare this gradation to the gradation of um, as two standards, it is comparable to the letter A and C. So for the target plasticity index of 5% and 9%, uh, our aggregate samples had different plasticity index at the beginning. So what we do is, what we did is, uh, the fraction passing number 40 sieve from, of cross gravel and cross limestone were blended with other fines material, such as ball clay, red clay, and uh, mineral. For the high plastic samples, we mix the um, aggregate fines with the ball clay and red clay. For non-plastic samples, um, for low plastic sample, 5% of plasticity we mix with uh, mineral fillers. So now we go into the results and discussion parts. First, we observe the shape of compaction curves, how the curves were uh, absorbed. So Lee and Sud came in 1972. They observed four different types of compaction curves. One is bell shape, another one one and one half peak shape. The third one is double peak shape and odd shape. So in our experiments, we saw three different shape, bell shape, one and one half peak shape, and odd shape. Those shapes are uh, for different materials for cross gravel, cross limestone, different fines content. For the shape of CBR curves, the majority of the curves were found to be on the overlapping each other. Uh, although they are soaked and unsoaked CBR, but the, this shows the same path and following in a parallel train. And the, most of them are in bell shape curves. The number of soaked and unsoaked CBR curves were, was found to approach each other just to the wet side of optimum moisture content. So we, we can say that to the dry side of optimum moisture content, the effect, effect of soaking is maximum. Some of the crushed gravel sample for soaked and unsoaked CBR, um, the CBR values were found to meet just near to the optimum moisture content. And some of the soaked and unsoaked CBR curves were also found to be parallel, but up to with a difference of up to maximum of 50 percent. So in the field, it is very difficult to achieve the CBR value corresponding with optimum moisture content because if we target optimum moisture content, we may not get the optimum moisture content. So average value of CBR, average CBR value at optimum moisture content and optimum moisture content plus minus 1.5 percentage was adapted to compare our soaked and unsoaked CBR results. So here uh, the, we have two graphs two plots. The left plot is for fine, fines content of 5 percentage. The right plot is for fines content of 12 percentage. So here, um, if we see at the bottom, we can see the circular symbol, circle with uh, circle for 
cross gravel and triangle for cross limestone. Similarly, the dark symbol represents the cross uh, represents the soaked CVR and hollow represents the unsoaked CVR. X axis is for dust ratio variation and Y axis is for CVR data. And the graphs, uh, the, the graph, the plot on the top is for 5% fines content, and the plot for the bottom is for 9% fines content. In the same way, we can see the plot for the 12% fines content also. So let's go to the uh, the results, findings of the research. So in, if we see for the dust ratio of 0.4 sample, we, 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 we could not find the effectiveness of soak, soaking and unsoaking. We found those values pretty much similar. So we can say that soaking had less effect on uh, dust ratio 0.4. Also, if we see the plasticity index of 5% and 9%, we could not find the much difference between the, uh, between the soaked and unsoaked CBR values. But regardless of PI, if we see the dust ratio variation from 0.4 to 0.6 to 1.0, uh, the soaked and unsoaked CBR values were found to be increased except for some of the crushed limestone samples. In the same way, for 12% fines content, regardless of PI, the dust ratio, um, the soaked and unsoaked CVR values, it increased with increasing dust ratio for majority of samples. If we uh, see the increasing of uh, PI effect, we found the soaked and unsoaked CBR values to be decreasing with increasing PI, generally for fines content of 12% samples. For, uh, with the increase of fines content from 5% to 12% in a sample of dust ratio 0.4, the soaked and unsoaked CBR values were found to uh, decrease. While if we see for the dust ratio of 0.6 and dust ratio of 1, the increasing of fines content from 5% to 12%, the soaked CVR and unsoaked CVR values increased for most of the samples. So based on those analyses, a general equation was developed for soaked, to find the soaked CVR based on the unsoaked CVR values. So we have we have here we have the equation soaked CVR is equals is equals to different factors times unsoaked CVR. Here the factors alpha p is for plasticity index correction factor, alpha f is for fines content correction factor, alpha d is for dust ratio correction factor, and alpha m is for material type correction factor. Here the table shows the the factors corresponding with those. Um, index properties. For example, if we say our sample has a plasticity index of 9%, fines content of 5%, and dust ratio of 0.6, and we have a material type of gravel. So if we plug in the, corresponding, uh, the correction factor corresponding with this index properties, we will get the soaked CBR values based on the unsoaked CBR values. So in a plot showing the estimated soaked CBR and so, uh, measured soaked CBR, the data are found to be in, reason, uh, in a good line of agreement. So here the, dash, the area between the two dashed lines shows the confidence, confidence interval of 90% and the error, uh, error was found to be only 12% for the prediction model. So how we verify this? We did. Uh, we took the different test samples. Those are the additional test samples. We consider the fines content of eight percentage, dust ratio of 0.4, PI of five percent and nine percentage, and we did. Uh, we and we estimate the soaked. Uh, we estimate the value of the soaked CVR uh, from this test. So we found that 
in a hollow symbols here in the plot we see the sum of the hollow symbols the, those hollow symbols are in good line of agreement they don't show that much of variation or they don't show the standard they don't show the high standard deviation so we come up with the strength zones of low medium and high so here the y axis is for fines content and x axis is for dust ratio and the first row shows uh, the strength cbr values of crushed gravel soaked strength and second one is for unsoaked crushed gravel third is for soaked crushed limestone and fourth row is for unsoaked crushed limestone here in the plot we see the left end and the right end so the left end represents the minimum cbr value and right end represents the maximum cbr value and also the low medium and high zones are for uh, are categorized based on the cbr values uh, of for low low for low for low zones we have cbr value less than 40 percentage for medium zone we have cbr value between 40 percent to 55 percent for high zone we have cbr value greater than 55 percent so most of those soaked and unsoaked cbr values were found to be on the medium to high strength zone if we see here we see the fines content of 5 percent with dust ratio of 0 0.4 and dust ratio of 0 0.6 and for the 12 percent fines content of dust ratio 0 0.6 and dust ratio 1 we can see the high uh, the cbr uh, values they belongs to medium and high strength zone only the cbr with the 12 percent fines content and dust ratio of 0 0.4 shows quite low cbr values in a, another study conducted by dr um, asuli at you know dr asuli et al he represents the plots in the different style although the uh, strength zones are similar it has low medium and high zones and th these are classified in the same way so and also let me clear one thing that this plot is for only ca6 cross limestone so we try to predict this values based on the predict uh, based on our equation so our equation prediction were represented by dark symbol with a red circle in the plot so if we see the value here for for a value of 51 that that was the actual value we found value of 53 from our prediction model so which is reasonable which is quite good so in conclusion so we found that cross gravel and cross limestone strengths are not much affected when the dust ratio is 0 0.4 and the sample has a fines content of 5 percent so in a, a prediction model was developed and validated to estimate the soaked cbr values of unbound aggregate from available unsoaked cbr values and the strength zones for crossed gravel and cross limestones were developed showing three zones of low medium and high zones so if those, those strength zones are good for practitioners those who have their index properties for example they have if they have plasticity index dust ratio or fines content they can go to the strength zone and find estimate their cbr values and soaked soaked strength is much lower than the unsoaked in cross limestone especially compared to the cross gravel thank you I was just wondering what material you use there. And then I have another follow-up. 
uh, when you talked about the aged bioswale, uh, I, you went into detail about how you determined the thickness of the material that would go there. How did you determine the state of that material, like how compacted it should be? Uh, because that's, of course, going to affect your permeability. Perfect question. Thank you very much. Well, okay, first, the filter was a geotextile, uh, geotextile material, WPE5N say on the construction part that I can zoom in and show it to you. This was, I don't know whether it's, it's obvious enough or not, but it was a geosynthetic material. It was just, it was an enter mineral, which the only reason that we used the filter because we didn't want to basically grow in medium, grow inside the gravel yeah. or, the, or the soil from the just one, one foot from the around the surrounding do not go into the gravel. So we just use that around it just, uh, just for the transferring water. It, the, the infiltration of that could be overlooked. I mean, it, it wouldn't block water as it can. For the sediment, actually we had a lot of discussion about that part, that how we should introduce that uh, sedimentation because, you know, in nature, it's not even, it's not no guarantee in a cleaner point that it's gonna be distributed evenly, it just washed away, it comes with water. So the best basically solution that we come up was to just distribute it evenly, we assume. We couldn't come up with any other suggestion or anything else. I mean, it would be something that we can, wor we can work on it in the future, but for now, we just did this with the seed line to uh, seed number eight, evenly over the surface of the diaspora. But I know it's not perfectly as it's in, it's in the nature, but it would, it would be the best that we could come up with. Thank you. Mm. Oh. Okay. Yes, maybe just a general question. If, if you can explain like uh, the difference in application between the biosol and the trench, like when do you use one of those? Could you repeat it again? Like, for example, uh, the two options, like when do you use them or when do you have them? Oh, uh, actually, uh, we didn't de we didn't define which type we want to work on. Actually, it was it was actually that, that one and we presented with all the typical one that we use anyway. And it, a lot of people were concerned about that. Why to choose the one or the other type? But since uh, you know, in, in the typical biosphere that we use in animal, we consider the vegetation a lot. Sure, but these are the two types. I my assumption, my personal assumption is that maybe they are the most typical ones that we use here, or it's suppose they are designed to be used in future here in the United States. Any other questions? I have a question for Bree. Thanks uh, for the very nice presentation. <coughs> when you mentioned uh, the different compaction curves, you said that uh, is the typical shape is the yeah. best shape, but you said that sometimes you get other shapes. Um, yeah, I like guess the gradation and like uh, it's a f since we combine different uh, fine materials to the aggregate in order to get different PI, like we combine ball clay or mineral fillers, different plasticity and different material. So we contribute these factors to all those fact uh, all those properties. And, uh, the one in five B is it more common when you have very low fine content? Uh, you mean like the B? S shape? Oh, this, this the second one? Yes, the second one. So you mean, you mean the... Uh, yes. This one, right? Yeah. Is it more common when you have low funds content? Uh, I don't think it's, um, it's, it's, it's common. We, most of the crops we found is for of build shape crops, like we found the build shape score in our experiment. So it is not really that it should be um, the main reason for, like, fines content should be the main reason for those kind of parts. So, 
I think like any any kind of factors that ca that, that can uh, cause this kind of cloud. Uh, like, and does the shape also influence the shape of the CPU actually? Um, you mentioned that, but I know. Uh, yeah, the the study was like yeah didn't mention the relation between the shape of the cloud with CVR cups. If we see here like the shape of the cups for uh, we have for crop gradual of fines content 12 percentage PI of 5 dust ratio of 1. Uh, we see the for different we see the different samples for here like for bell shape. If we see same bell shape bell shape cut, we have two different samples showing different shapes. So it, it is not necessarily that it should be similar. Yeah. 